Um, I'm Noah Hulkabor. I'm a sophomore at Grand Valley. And as my colleagues have made clear, uh, we're talking about tree architecture, specifically using photography. Um, but what I'm going to be talking about is in the entire plot level. So basically over the summer, I photographed every single tree in a plot. Uh, and then this is an anal analysis of their architecture um, and how that has an interplay with the forest stand structure. Um, oop. So a little bit of background first, I won't spend too much time here, but woody parts of a tree, they have like two main tasks. They gotta transport water, they gotta support the structure of the tree. And different species optimize for these things differently. Some trees are better than others at certain tasks. And we experimentally figure this out, uh, this optimization, by looking at different models uh, via a ratio between mother and daughter branching points. So as you can see on that image right there, mother is before branching point and the two daughters are after. And the ratio between those two is what the actual models look at. Now, previously, all published research on this topic has been destructively. And so what we in Professor Greer's lab are trying to do is do this non-destructively. So my specific study, um, basically over the summer, I selected a plot in the GBSU ravines, and then I mapped out boundaries to that and the location of individuals. I took physical measurements, then I took photo photographs of all the trees and their first nodes, measured those images in image J, and then did data analysis. So our plot was a quarter hectare and it's in the GBSU ravines. Uh, you can see there how it is in relation to campus. Uh, the plot was 25 meters by 100 meters, so kind of long and skinny. <laughs> um, and it was partially on a slope and it was all deciduous trees. And I know it's all deciduous trees because I've uh, interacted with every single tree in that plot. <laughs> Um, so in terms of mapping and measurements, the, the plot was measured by hand. Uh, you can see that image there. You can kind of see the measuring tape I used just because on such a small scale in the forest, GPS measurements uh, just aren't really accurate for trying to map out a plot. Uh, and, mount, and boundary trees were marked. Uh, I measured the DBH of each tree, at least the ones that were above five centimeters in diameter. Those were the ones that we were actually considering for a study. Um, and each tree, its location was kind of roughly mapped uh, partially by eye and relative to other trees, but also using a laser distance measure to actually measure the distance to boundary trees. Uh, you can see the other image there is a picture of my field book and that's half of the plot mapped out and all those little dots are where individual trees are. Um, so that in the future, hopefully people can come back and find those exact same trees and measure them if we wanna do longitudinal, a longitudinal study. So then uh, kind of the meat of the, the study is scaled photography. And so the first branching point, uh, which we called node one of each tree was photographed with a scale bar. Um, and that's important because we're gonna then do scaled measurements. So we need a scale bar. Um, and something that is new this year for the study that I didn't do in past uh, years is we have an extending pole uh, where we basically tie a, a meter long piece of pipe to the end of a 30 foot extending pole and put it up next to the node if it's high up there. Um, as you can see a little bit in the images. Um, but that helps us a lot with being able to take the photos closer to the node and still have a scale there. It's also kind of fun to mess around with a 30 foot extending pole on a slope in the middle of the woods. Uh, there's also some challenges with the photography. Um, there's limitations that exist that are just inherent. You know, you're taking pictures instead of cutting it down, but there's also some that are just maybe can be worked around. Um, like you have to maybe take it at a weird angle because of the other trees in the area or the slope you're on. Um, also, some of the trees were difficult or impossible to photograph in that sometimes they were covered by the canopy, which can sometimes be worked around by taking the pictures in winter, um, or they were just too high up, um, or various other problems. Some of them are just kind of ambiguous. Um, if you look at these two photos down here, this one, we've got a, a dead branch here and then a node where there's kind of three branches at the same point. And so ultimately I just have to make a call. Um, and then here we've got a big burl at the first node that, you know, who knows what that really does to our data. Um, and so because I'm in a plot and I've got to measure every single tree, some of them are going to be ambiguous, um, but spoiler alert, we can get good stuff from them anyway. Uh, this is also just an image showing that this is a three meter pole right here that we use for whole tree images. And this is the huge extending pole so we can really get up there. Um, yeah, 
Um, just looking at some basic uh, results uh, in plot, plot composition, uh, Acer saccharum and Quercus rubra, um, sugar maple and red oak, they're really the dominant species in the plot, as you can see. Um, but uh, Acer saccharum has many more small individuals, whereas um, red oak has uh, a couple large individuals, as you can really see by, they've got very similar some DBHs, um, but the species composition, there's way more individuals of Acer saccharum. Um, getting a little bit more complex, looking at the whole plot in, in aggregate, you know, all the species together, uh, we see that Murray's Law, which some of my colleagues already talked about, uh, it predicts per, uh, area preservation at branching points um, as a way of measuring um, a tree's optimization for hydraulic efficiency. Um, so looking at this graph, it's basically looking at the Murray's mothers, the kind of formula for below the branching point and Murray's daughters on the y-axis, uh, you know, looking at Murray's model for after the branching point. And we can see that in aggregate, like all the species together, they are very close to being hydraulically optimized. Um, we can see a little bit of a drop off in the larger individuals, um, which suggests that maybe they're keeping more of a safety margin. Um, basically, the closer you get to being optimized or you know having a ratio or a slope of one, uh, the more likely you are to have embolism. And so it seems that larger trees maybe aren't optimizing quite as much. But even that, it's a very small drop off. And I won't spend much time here, but this graph is basically the same as the last one. But on the y-axis is a, that ratio that I just showed you compared with the log DVH. Uh, and this is just showing that size is not as big of a factor here. It's relatively independent of size, um, you know, R squared of 11.11. Um, but there is a, a slight negative linear relationship. And that is just indicating, again, that we see larger trees being slightly less optimized. So it's really saying the same message as that last graph, just in a different way. Uh, looking at the forest stand as a whole in terms of area preservation, um, this chart is a little bit more complicated, but I'll break it down a little bit. Basically, the y-axis shows the log radius at breast height of an individual tree. And then the x-axis is the log radius again, but of the next smallest tree in the plot. Um, and so. Basically, what this graph shows is how, like, how different are the trees, like, in size to their next closest neighbor in the plot. Um, and we can see, like, this is really consistent. Um, you know, very high R squared. Um, there is again a slight drop off in the larger trees, and that's just uh, saying that the bigger trees are slightly more different from other bigger trees in terms of radii than the smaller trees are, which kind of anecdotally makes sense if you think about trees in a forest that the big trees are going to maybe be a little bit more variable. Um, now we can also compare this to individuals. So on the left is that same graph and on the right is just the mother branching point area, which is measured from the, the photos, you know, of individual trees. And then you've got on the y-axis, the, the daughters, you know, it's just seeing if area is preserved at branching points. And these graphs look very, very similar and they are somewhat analogous because for the forest stand, the radii are measured from DBH and that's a parallel to the area uh, on the other graph because that area is from diameter. So those are analogous measurements. Um, and this right here, actually like this is, analogous to each other, even though one is looking at the entire plot as a whole and one is looking at trees as individuals. Um, and we're not the first to think of this. We're actually taking this idea from a paper by Wes Brown and Enquist published in 2009. And what the result of that means is that our forest stand is optimizing in a way that is similar to, or, or it's optimizing to fill area in a way that is similar to how an individual tree optimizes to fill area, like as a hierarchical branching network, um, which is kind of crazy and super interesting, but also makes sense because an individual tree is just trying to, you know, optimize to catch the most sunlight and an entire forest stand is also partitioning area to try and capture as much sunlight. And if there are some principles underneath all this that are built in physics, not necessary, but necessarily biology, um, 
we might expect to see forests and individual trees optimizing in similar ways. Looking at some species specific analysis quickly, um, we have this chart right here, which compares uh, the results of Murray's ratio and the results of the uniform stress model. Um, and if we had a slope of, and each line is an individual species, uh, and these are the top five in our plot. Um, and as my colleagues have mentioned, the uniform stress model, uh, USM, measures the optimization for the structural support limbs. Um, so if we had, say, a species that had a slope of one, that would mean that it was equally optimized for Murray's ratio and uniform stress model, and thus it was equally optimized for hydraulic efficiency and for the support of its limbs. Um, but we don't see any species that have one. In fact, most of the species are have a slope of above one, meaning that they're more optimized for the support of their limbs. Um, kind of clearing up the clutter a little bit, this is that same graph, just only with Acerosacrum and Quercus rubra, the two dominant species in the plot. Um, and they're optimizing very differently. Um, Quercus rubra is has a slope of less than one, so it's more optimized for hydraulic efficiency. And Acerosacrum has a speed has a slope higher than one, and so it's more optimized for the support of its limbs. Um, and why that necessarily is, we don't know for sure, but they fill different roles in the plot and here they are optimizing differently. Um, and these optimizations do have impacts. There's of course benefits associated with being optimized, but there's also costs like you might not be, a tree might not be able to be optimized perfectly for everything. Being more optimized for hydraulic efficiency might mean making sacrifices in the support of the limbs. And there's also safety margins to consider in that the closer you are to being optimized for a trait, you get more benefits, but there's also more risks. Um, like with the uniform stress model, the closer you are to being optimized, or if you're over-optimized, you're going to be able to support bigger limbs, but there's also, you know, more risk that those limbs might break off. And with hydraulic efficiency, the closer you get to perfect hydraulic efficiency, the easier you're going to be able to move water through the tree, but the closer you are to having a risk of embolism occurring. And so there's, there's benefits and also costs and risks. And this, is, uh, this difference that we see is actually a species difference, not just a size difference. We ran a regression looking at the top five species in the plot and this ratio right here compared to DBH and found that it was not significant. And so even though the average acrosacrum is much smaller than the average Quercus rubra, uh, that does not seem to be the reason why we see this different difference in optimization. It seems to truly be a, a difference between the species. So the overall conclusions from what I've done is, is first and foremost that photography can produce some valid data despite its limitations. Um, as I mentioned, and, and even stuff that I didn't mention, my photos were rough. Uh, I, I mean, I did a good job. I think I you know, tr tried to do the best they could, but they're rough and they're always going to be rough. Um, yeah, photographs are never going to completely replace cutting down a tree. But as I and my colleagues have shown, like you can get good data without cutting down trees. And this opens up the ability to do studies like I did, where you can look at, you know, over a hundred trees. And that would just be impossible or near impossible if you had to cut every single tree down. Um, and secondly, we see that species, at least in our plot and aggregate, are very close to hydraulic efficiency. Um, and this is, this is what we would expect. So this lends credence to the photographs. Um, you know, we would expect that as a plot as a whole, it's, they're going to go for, for being optimized to be hydraulically efficient. Um, and what I think is the most fascinating result is that we, we see that this forest stand, it optimizes to fill space, to capture more sunlight in a way that individual trees also do because at a certain point there are physical principles of the universe really that mean that some strategies are just better for, for filling space to catch light and that's utilized both by the individual and by the collective. Um, and finally looking at species specific results that I just mentioned we see that Acerosacrum is optimizing for structural support and Quercus rubra is optimizing for hydraulic efficiency. And that's a, a big difference between the two dominant species in the plot. And those differences are due to them being different species, not just because they uh, have different size distributions. So thank you very much for listening. I would just like to acknowledge Gary Greer for excellent mentorship throughout this whole process. Uh, I've been working with him for over a year now. 
and thank Grand Valley because the work that I did over the summer was funded by Grand Valley State University and that I wouldn't have been able to invest as much time if I uh, wasn't funded. Um, so thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions for me, I would love to hear them. Questions for Noah. So we only got like two minutes, but I was a really interested that plant size, individual plant size did not matter. That answered a question that I, you answered that question that I had. Yeah, I can uh, actually show you that, um, which is a bit more on yeah. showing that it wasn't about plant size, yeah. at least for Aces Ackerman Quercus rubra. So that's actually really, really helpful. Um, the the similarity between plants for hydraulic efficiency, I think, makes sense. Your explanation of trees filling space using a similar method because of the physics, I think that makes a lot of sense. I was intrigued that sugar maple and red oak had somewhat different, significantly different ways of managing this. No. Yeah. So what kinds of habitats do we tend to find red oak in that is somewhat different than we would typically find sugar maple in? Um, I mean, I'm not 100% sure, but I like anecdotally think of uh, red oak as being a bit more tolerant of sandy soils than sugar maple and sugar maple being a bit of a generalist. Boy, that's certainly what I think of. And, you know, so I'm thinking of like oak savannas yeah. are typically sandy soils. we got a lot of oak savannas in Michigan because of the sandy soils associated with the glacial deposits, all that kind of thing. Which would make sense with oak being, you know, really optimizing for being able to, you know, efficiently yeah, exactly. move whatever water it can get. That was, that was my point. That was, that was what kind of, you know, hit me in the side of the head going, that makes perfect sense. So it would be interesting now to pattern something like, to do a study like kind of like this, and let's say add in um, American beach. So yeah, I mean, typical we have, we association. Have American beach, uh, looking at uh, this next line, uh, that oh, orange wow. is American beach right there. Look at that, it's sitting right on sugar maples and sugar mm -hmm. maples and American beach comprise tip, a very typical plant community in Michigan. Yeah. They usually no, I mean, are found together in, yep. you know, climax communities. Yeah, American beech was one of the other, you know, I wouldn't say dominant, but more prevalent species in the plot. Yeah. Um, and what I mean, what we hope to do in the future at some point is um, have a second plot somewhere, either me or, or someone else at some point, or even researchers in a different part of the country. If they did something that we did, uh, similar to what we did, and then we had multiple plots that we could compare, um, it'd be fascinating. Well, I, I think you're, I know we're kind of out of time. We need to move to Andrew, but um, yeah, that, that's kind of the question is now that you have, the, you've kind of validated the ability to use photographs to do this, um, what can you learn from exploiting these, understanding about these relationships in, in it's the, to me, it's understanding and be able to, to quantify the relative competitiveness of, of yeah. these species. And well, you especially can predict when... where they're going to, you can predict where species would do well. Yeah, well, and especially with like our photographic methodology, like it takes work, but it's not that technically challenging. Right. And so, you know, we're hoping that, you know, if we, if we hopefully when we publish this, this work, that it's a tool that people around the country can use to more easily measure these things and that maybe it will be more widely studied. Um, mm -hmm. And thus there'll be much more data available for species and, and, habitat and we might be able to better understand how microanatomy, genetics, and habitat all play a role in determining an individual or species in a certain area, uh, their optimization and architecture. Yeah, I mean, I was optimization, I was starting to think about what um, foresters would be after in terms of timber, timber. Yeah, you know, think what are going to do the best here. In carbon, in carbon sequestration. sequestration. Yeah, that's one of our other things that we're thinking about. And yeah. how this plays into that. All right. Thank you, Noah. That was pretty cool. Thank well, you and, very and for much. For the sequence, the sequence made beautiful sense, um, particularly now looking back at it. So thank you for suggesting that. Yeah.